uh, humans are, are different than all other species because we spend a lot of time thinking about the future. Think about that. You know, do rabbits worry a lot? No, okay? At least I don't think so. Um, but, but humans think about the future all the time. They think about, you know, the next two minutes. I'm wondering if people are really going to come back from lunch. Uh, you know, they think about the next two years. They think about the next 200 years. I wish they would think about that more. And I'll get, that, uh, get back to that in, in just a second. But what I'm supposed to be uh, doing for you in the next 20 minutes or so is telling you a bit about a gigantic project uh, that's going on right now at Harvard, um, the subtitle of which you see here, The Past and Present of the Future. The whole effort uh, was started as part of an edX online course, not a MOOC, okay, but a, a collection of materials that are being put online through the edX platform that's called PredictionX. You see the logo there. I'll be telling you a lot about what that logo means in just a second. But I should explain that while I'm representing the project here today, there are about 20 Harvard faculty from across the university involved in this because what it does is it traces the history of prediction all the way from Mesopotamian sheep and trails to modern climate change simulations. And I'm just gonna give you a little tiny taste of what we're doing today and give you some idea about the motivations that people have uh, when they think about the future. So I mentioned that I would break apart this logo for you and explain it to you and basically, you probably, the people in this audience explain, understand the one on the right the best, okay? There's, I saw somebody outside with a Bluetooth headset, okay? So we're, we're used to technology and we're used to thinking about our future in terms of what technology can tell us, what kind of simulations we can make about the future. But if you think about it, the um, uh, predecessor of those kind of simulations is the Oracle of Delphi and Chinese Oracle bones and reading the future from Mesopotamian sheep entrails. So what we thought was that we would go back and take a look at the whole thing. And I just, is uh, Rodrigo here yet? Where's Rodrigo? He's not here yet, but Rodrigo gave the wonderful talk about the free diving this morning and I thought I would just tell you that um, the Mesoamerican cultures really did believe in this connection between gods and humans. And one of the things that's really interesting is they actually, uh, the gods got annoyed at the humans, the way that the cosmology goes early in the history of the world, that the humans knew just as much as they did about the future. And the gods did something that David Carrasco, who's one of the people who participates in our course, explained as breathing on a mirror, blurring humans' view of the future, so that now we have to do all these crazy things to try to understand and divine the future, whereas before we were godlike and, and knew that. But um, I don't know about you, but I can't see the future so easily. But if we go back to this uh, original part of the course here, the oldest part of the course, and we think about, by the way, that's a picture of a Mayan astronomer from a, a Mayan codex, and his eye is really long because he's looking at the sky. Um, so anyway, so that's uh, our symbol there for early times. And in early times, uh, if you saw something unusual, like a bird flying by or a flock of birds flying by, uh, you might turn around and pay attention. And if you saw this enough times, you get kind of observant about it. And eventually you think, hey, you know, maybe this means something. I'm going to see these random things in the world, but, you know, if they seem to happen at particular times, I'm going to use them to make some kind of prediction about the future. And so, you know, most early predictions work that way. But it turns out that there are several other systems, most of which are used today still, uh, in order to make predictions. And different kinds of inputs go into those uh, systems. And the thing is that uh, I could tell you about all the different kinds of prediction that I've learned about in this effort, but I would suggest instead that you go to Wikipedia and look up, not right now, but look up methods of divination. And you will see a list of something like almost a thousand different things, you know, divination by dripping wax and all kinds of crazy things. But let me just group the systems into these sort of four categories and give you quickly uh, a couple of examples. And I'll, I'll show you a, a funny thing about an Egyptian bobblehead in just a second. Okay, but let me just tell you what these four words mean. So random I explained as Roman augury is, is what the, the flight of birds was meant to represent. So augury, the word augur, you know, to sort of give bad omens about the future, um, that comes from augury, from looking at the flight of birds, uh, which the Etruscans and the Romans and even the Mesopotamians were really into. And they thought that this 
meant a lot, and that is a pretty much a random occurrence. What's interesting is that things like comets, which people thought to be random occurrences because they didn't understand that comets were repeating on orbits, uh, used to be you know, harbingers of great doom, and they've now moved into a different category here, which we could call deterministic. So astrology is actually a deterministic system it's a system input for prediction. So in other words, we know where all the planets are going to be, and even if we didn't understand the motion of the planets as the ancients did not, they knew that there were repeating patterns. And so all kinds of weird conjunctions of astronomical objects became, again, harbingers, mostly of bad things. But anyway, so that's what we mean by a deterministic input to a predictive system. Randomized is like throwing dice, okay? This particular example is from the IFA divination system that's popular with the Yoruba culture, mostly in Nigeria today, but actually all over the world from the di diaspora from that part of the world. And it has to do with stones and a tray and sand. And ask me at dinner, there's an amazing story about that particular system which persists uh, to this day. But what I wanna do is show you the human divination system, you know, when you go to a seance or something and someone can see the future for you and tell you about it. Well, the Egyptians were very into this uh, as well, and they had these special statues that I'm gonna let Peter Manuelian, who's the head of the Semitic Museum at Harvard, tell you about in this cute little video clip. So this is just very short, and uh, let me just play it for you here. Um, here we go. And this is when individuals might approach with a petition, yay or nay, Am I in good shape? Has someone stolen from me? What about this cow that I bought? Have I paid on the installment plan correctly? Or is someone throwing an accusation at me? What should I do? All kinds of questions would come. So how would the god indicate what the right thing to do was? The hieroglyphs talk about nodding in approval or disapproval. And there's some disagreement about whether the statues actually had some moving parts and might invoke their head a little bit. That is probably unlikely. More likely is that the statue in its bark would be brought by the priest either forward to say yes or backwards to say no, or perhaps lean to one side or another if there are two competing petitions brought. And this is how the god would signal approval or disapproval. So clearly the priests were having their own opinions about what your future should be. Peter is not so clear about whether or not the dolls had this segmented head, but I kind of hope that they did because it's funnier that way. Um, but anyway, so I would call it a bobblehead, but he would not. Uh, and uh, so again, that's just part of the kinds of inputs. They really do fall into these four groups that you can have uh, of things that you can observe and then try to input those into a predictive system. And so all of those existed in ancient times, and usually people made a prediction and then that was the end of the story. And what's really weird about this is that today, we would always want to know, did it come true, right? Um, there wasn't a huge amount of that. Even Aristotle was not really into proofs, okay? He was just, this is beautiful, so it is true. And that was essentially the end of the story. And so the idea that we have now about the way modern science is done is something relatively new. And so if we go from the ancient system to the, the sort of evolution of what we call from data to theory in the course, and which I'll come back to later, what happened was around the time of the Renaissance, people started making more and more scientific instruments. And actually it happened a lot before that in the Islamic world, and I'll come back to that later. But basically, the better you can get at measuring things and looking for the outcomes of your predictions in certain situations, the more interested you get in checking them. So when we get, um, you know, we start to get a little bit of a suggestion of looking at the accuracy of your prediction and then making some changes to your system and then going back and, and iterating. But it's not until you get really to the modern world, the iPad, Bluetooth guy world, uh, that we start really having this kind of iterative cycle where you go around and around making better and better observations and then improving your algorithms and your predictions. Uh, you don't see that until really very recent times. And you've probably all seen um, things that look like this. And if you look in the yellow box over there, you see that to go from my office to Logan Airport, I would have, a, that's the airport in Boston, for those of you who've never been there, uh, I'd have a choice of 17 minutes, 29 minutes, or 32 minutes uh, in order to get there. So this, this uh, wonderful magic, Google Maps, is predicting my future, okay? So navigation is something that people don't think about as prediction, 
but when you get in your car and something is telling you how many minutes into the future it's going to be until you get someplace, that is a very real and everyday form of prediction. And so this is one where you can really see what's going on. Some of you might even work for these companies. Here, you know, if you read what it says on the slide, it says most companies who do live traffic compare their predictions against actual time and traffic to tune their algorithms and data sources. And then the companies that do that the best win, and that's why most of us use Google Maps and not you know, Yahoo Maps. Sorry for anybody who works for Yahoo. <laughs> okay. So anyway, we are very used to this, okay? But it did not used to be that way. And we're so used to it <laughs> that you know, this is a real picture that I took uh, last year in Rome. And if you look very carefully, that guy uh, driving the horse-drawn cart to the Colosseum is on his iPhone and, you know, he's probably looking, you know, how long does it take to get by horse-drawn cart to the Colosseum through this bad construction uh, where he is. Or he could be uh, looking at a number of, of other things on that phone. You can actually do this IFA divination that I mentioned, the African system with the shaking tray and the stones. You can do that on your iPhone. Uh, Worldwide Telescope, a program that Curtis Wong, who's here, can tell you lots about because he invented it. You can run simulations of the uh, positions of the planets on your iPhone. Uh, another app that we developed for the course shows you the weather forecast in Boston with uncertainty. I'll come back to uncertainty for the rest of my presentation in a moment. Um, I don't know why the guy in Rome would want to know the weather in Boston, but let's just leave that, okay? You also can do the Mesopotamian sheep entrail uh, uh, expertise uh, evaluation here. Actually, this, this particular site is not about uh, intestines, it's about livers, okay? So the Mesopotamians were obsessed with the livers of sheep and asked me later about the theoretical sheep liver divination guide called the Burutu that can be compared to Isaac Newton's Principia. If that's not enough for a cocktail conversation, I don't know what is. <laughs> okay, so anyway, you can do that on your phone, all right? And of course, you can look at the stock market and many of these apps will even predict the future of the stock market for you. So we're all very used to this. And in some cases, not all, but in some cases, people think really hard about the accuracy of all of these predictions that we can get in our everyday life. But I will now confess to you that the original motivation for this whole project was when I was on sabbatical uh, at WGBH several years ago, that's the public television states makes Nova, if you're not familiar with which one it is, uh, I was their scholar in residence and they said to me, what do you think the public doesn't understand about science that they really need to understand? And I said, how important computer simulations are. That's not taught in school and that's how so much of science is done and the future of the world literally relies on it, okay? So climate change in particular um, is, is a field where we are completely dependent on simulations and the public has no idea uh, for the most part how these work. And this is just one cartoon that shows you the kinds of inputs and predictions that are made associated with climate change simulation. And if you look very carefully, you'll see that some of the inputs are the kinds of inputs they can be categorized into the kinds that I mentioned before. You know, changes in the sun has a somewhat random component. You know, yes, we can model the chemistry of clouds pretty well. There's some uncertainty, which I'll get to in a minute. Human influence is how humans are gonna behave in these future worlds, we don't really know. Um, and then we have to run the simulations again and again because we really only have one Earth and one future, but we have to randomize the inputs and see how this works. And so these kind of concepts is what I really wanted to get across. And the people at uh, GBH are very clever and our uh, Curtis and my mutual friend Howard Cutler said, why don't you connect this to ancient forms of prediction and get people to think about why humans think about the future and how they do it now and what the critical aspects are. So these are the three critical aspects I wanna spend the last of the time talking about. One is how well can we actually know the future and can we evaluate how well we know that, okay? Another one is what is it that we really want to know? Do we want an accurate position, uh, prediction? Do we just wanna think about the future? Do we wanna talk about the future? Do we wanna make change in the future, right? And then another one is how much do we already know that we haven't thought about, okay? So we'll get back to each of these in turn. So the first one comes back to uh, my GBH experience. There in education, there's a term called scaffolding, okay? Which 
by the way, doesn't get used much among university teachers, so I didn't know this, okay? But, but in, in uh, education research, there's this idea that you need to teach people a very basic concept so that they can understand a very complicated one. So you can't just jump in and say, I'm going to explain to you what the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change does every year when they involve 400 scientists in making these extremely sophisticated simulations. Instead, you have to say, what's a simulation? What's uncertainty? What's a cause of uncertainty in a simulation? So one of the things we envisioned, which we've now done, is to make some really simple online games. And so in this particular one, what you can do is you can evaluate how accurately you can aim that little puck down the red line at the wall at the back there, okay? Now if life was perfect and the table was perfectly smooth and quantum mechanics didn't exist um, and you had perfect aim, then you slid that puck, it would hit the same place on the wall every single time, right? And how well can you know you could know infinitely perfectly where that was going to hit, okay? But you can imagine, you don't even have to do the experiment, the rougher I make that table, the less certain I can be of exactly where that puck is gonna hit. So in this game that you can go play online, you can throw the puck a number of times and what you see in the little corner there is the distributions of the positions that the puck hits. And so we give people little teaching tools like this and this is what you can do in an online course which is not really a course, by the way. This is just a lot of material that gets repurposed however people want, but you could do all of it. Anyway, you can do that online, and it's pretty impossible uh, to do that uh, in person in real time, okay? So that's how we tell people how well they could possibly know. We scaffold that experience. This one was really weird, okay? I should say that these three examples that I've chosen to show you all involve Harvard students. So the previous uh, example was coded by a Harvard astronomy graduate student who's really interested in the project. This guy here, Chengis Chim Chimogalu, I can never pronounce his name. He's got a fantastic backstory, okay? But part of the way he put himself through high school was actually by doing coffee ground divination in Turkish coffee shops in Azerbaijan, okay? So this guy's now a Harvard student, and uh, he was working as a freshman intern on our, on our course, and he said, oh, would you like me to tell your fortune from coffee grounds? I said, sure. So we, there's this lovely video, you can see how to make Turkish coffee and learn this whole story online, okay? But as part of the conversation, he said something that was just so illuminating to me. So he said to me, he said, you know, this, this fortune I'm giving you only lasts 40 days, and I said, Really? I said, why? He said, so you have to come back and get another one. <laughs> and I said, great, Cheng, that's, that's really nice. Um, uh, how am I going to do that? You know, and never mind, he, he promised to do it. But the point is that in the coffee shops, people come back all the time. And they don't come back because the fortunes expire. They come back because they want to, okay? And so he explained to me that it's a complete social experience. It's like getting a massage or a haircut or something. It's people love, it's kind of the way people like to talk about themselves. They also really like to talk about their future, okay? So what they want to know isn't really exactly what's going to happen. It's just that they want to talk about it, okay? And so there's value to prediction that I didn't even really realize, and it's not till I talked to a lot of humanists and English majors that I even considered the idea that no one would even care whether their prediction was gonna come true. But it turns out this is widely true. And this one, I saved the best for last, is the weirdest, okay? So one of my colleagues in the anthropology department has a friend from graduate school uh, who became a performance artist. And this guy's name is James Leonard, um, and he's built this thing which is called the divination tent. And after I found out what it was and understood who James was, he's a brilliant guy, um, we had him bring this to the roof of the Center for Astrophysics at Harvard, and the people you see in there are a bunch of Harvard freshmen who are having tarot readings done. Okay, why are we doing tarot readings on the roof of an observatory at Harvard? Because the whole point of this tent is what you kind of see here in the sign that describes it, okay? Where it says, uh, a portable sacred space for contemplating the impacts of climate change. There's a whole long video, again, you can go watch it online, where James explains that what he wanted was for people to think about what they already know about the Earth's future and about climate change. And so one way of predicting the future is just to acknowledge what you already know about the future. And that sounds 
a little obvious, but it turns out it's really deeply meaningful. So as a scientist, I really thought that what was important was to think about the evolution of how we got to this sort of iterative system, but it turns out there's much more to it. But just that said, I wanna close with one more little treat for later. So I only talked about the beginning, the kind of uh, super superstitious uh, traditions, and the end, modern simulations. I wanna tell you that there's a very long story uh, in between, I will hold this up here, and this is part of it, okay? It's called The Rise of Theory, and this graphic that you certainly can't read on the screen but that you can play with later, uh, is called The Path to Newton, and it explains how you get my right hand from the Mesopotamians noticing that stars repeat their positions in the sky to Isaac Newton's predictive theory of gravity, which so many things we do today, uh, including sending spacecraft to other planets, uh, rely upon. And so I couldn't quite do this all for you, so I brought, I brought you this, and so you can make a nice shawl. I don't know what else you can do with it. But anyway, I just want you to please not stop thinking about...